In this video, I want to explain how independent sampling can be used to do integration. And I'm going to explain this concept by a series of examples. The first example is imagining that we have some dye that is in a box, and we actually can't see the dye, but we can shake the box and magically or electronically, whenever we shake the box and put it down, the number which is currently face up appears on the side. So in this circumstance, we're going to imagine that the following things are unknown to us, which are the number of faces. So whilst I've drawn this die as a cube, it could in fact have any number of possible sides. And similarly, the probabilities of each of the faces are completely unknown. Um, it doesn't really matter, but we're going to assume that each of the faces has a number, an integer, from one up to however many faces there are. So let's, let's imagine that the thing that we want to calculate is the expected value of throwing our die, and we're going to use the random variable x to represent the numerical outcome of throwing the die. So to work out the expectation, what we would usually do is we would sum over, in this case, the number of faces of x times the probability that a random variable equals that particular x. So x here, just for clarity, would be sort of 1, 2, 3, all the way up to however many faces there are. But the problem here is that we don't know the number of faces, nor do we know the underlying probability distribution. So it seems that we're a bit stuck. But what can we do? We know that we can shake the box, and each time we shake the box, that gives us a sample from the underlying probability distribution of our die. So what we could do is we could say, well, the true mean value of our random variable x, the true mean number that appears on the die, could be approximated by 1 over n times the sum of xi, where i is going from 1 to n, where n is the number of times we, we shake the box and record the result. And we're imagining here that xi is being drawn from our probability distribution. So in other words, what we do is we replace the true mean, the expectation of x, by the sample mean, which is just x bar. So the question is, can we use this strategy to help us to work out the expected value of x? So now I want to try and illustrate to you by means of simulation how actually doing this independent sampling can allow us to estimate the true value of the mean of the die. So what I've done computationally is I've simulated a die which has an unknown number of faces, which just happens to be 50 in this case, and associated with each of those numbers that we could possibly roll on our die, there is a random probability. And these probabilities are such that if you add them all together, you get one. So it is a valid probability distribution. But I'm assuming that we don't know that when I'm actually doing the simulation. All I'm doing is assuming that we're able to sample from that die. So what I'm going to show you down here is how, over time, if we sample our die, so we started off by sampling a value of 8, the number 8 from our die, how the running mean is going to approach the true mean. And the true mean happens to be somewhere like here. So it's near 25, but it's slightly higher than 25 for our kind of randomly assigned probability distribution. But what we're hopefully going to see is that as I sample more often from the die, that the running mean, which is just shown in blue here, should get closer and closer to the true mean. And so we can see after about 50 shakes, we're getting pretty close of our box, our computational box. And then after I sort of go to about 100 samples from my die, we're doing pretty well. Our sample mean is approximating the true mean of the die very, very well. So this is quite useful because remember, we didn't know the number of faces a priori, ne neither did we know the probabilities of each of the sides. And so we've kind of done maths unconsciously, which is always the type of maths that we'd like to do if we can possibly do so, because it's much easier than actually having to work out these expectations by hand. And in case you think that this is just relevant to working out the mean of the die, you could have also done the same thing, or we could have also done the same thing by working out the expected value of x squared. 
So the expected value of x squared exactly would be given by the sum over the number of faces of x squared times the probability that x, a random variable, equals that particular value of x. So if we knew the number of faces and we knew the probability of each of those faces, we could work out the expected value of x squared exactly. But assuming we don't, what we could do is we could just approximate that by the sample mean of xi squared, where xi is an individual sample taken from the underlying probability distribution of the die. And here we're assuming that it's an independent sample, but that doesn't really matter too much. The estimator still can be a good estimator, even if we have dependent samples, as we shall see when we come to discuss MCMC in the future. So now I want to imagine a situation where we've still got our die in the box, but the number of faces is going to infinity. So obviously this is a very strange die indeed, and we're going to imagine that the number associated with each of those faces occupies all the real numbers between 0 and 1. So each of the faces is one particular number. So one of the faces might have the value 0 0.01. Another one might have the value 0 0.0001. Another one might have the value 0 0.45. Another 0 0.92, etc. And we're continuing by stacking these all up until we eventually get to one. Obviously, this is just a thought experiment. Those of you that are familiar with Cantor sets know that it's not possible to actually do this kind of construction, but nonetheless, bear with me. So if we imagine that every number between zero and one has a face associated with it, and we are also going to imagine that each of those faces has the same probability of landing face up, then what we have is we have a uniform distribution between 0 and 1, and it's a continuous uniform distribution between 0 and 1. So now the question is, can we use the same sampling strategy to determine the expected value of x? So this is just x still, because if we can do, then remember that now because we're dealing with a continuous example, the expected value of x will actually be given by the integral between 0 and 1 of x times the probability density of x with respect, integrated with respect to x. So if our independent sampling strategy still works, then essentially we have unconsciously evaluated an integral by sampling. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to computationally simulate lots of draws of x from the underlying probability distribution, a continuous uniform between 0 and 1. And then we're, as we did last time, we're going to look at the, how the sample mean hopefully approaches the true mean of the distribution, which for a continuous uniform between 0 and 1 is just a half, as we throw our die more often and record the result. So now, just showing you the simulation results, we're starting off by sampling a value of about 0.46, and I'm going to run our sampler, and we're going to see that we're sampling fairly uniformly across the range between 0 and 1, but Nevertheless, even though we are now talking about a continuous distribution, our sample mean, the blue line, is getting closer and closer to the true mean over time. And if I was to simulate this continuous sampling process for much longer, you would get ever closer to that line. Of course, it can walk further away for a given period of time, like it does between 30 and about 60 here, but in the long run, the sampling mean actually approaches the true mean of the die. So a question that you might have is, can I use this sampling strategy with more complex distributions than the continuous uniform distribution? So for example, consider this bimodal distribution that we have here. Can I work out what the mean of this bimodal distribution, which I've sort of constructed so that it has a mean of zero, is by using sampling? Because if it can, then that gives us an indication that sampling might be a way to evaluate integrals more generally. So now I'm going to show you results of simulating samples from the stranger distribution. And so we can see that now we are sampling from the modes of the distribution, which were located near 5 and minus 5, respectively. But nonetheless, the sample mean is approaching the true mean, which is near 0. So we can see that this sampling strategy for the stranger distribution 
also works. After about 100 throws, our estimated mean is actually very close to the true mean. So what does all of this tell us? Well, it tells us that if we are able to sample from a distribution, then we are able to approximate integrals. Importantly, those examples that I've given thus far have assumed that we're able to independently sample from a distribution. But unfortunately, we shall see that independent sampling is more difficult to do in practice than it might first appear. And that's what I'm going to discuss in the next few videos.